All right. Hey, BD friends. Welcome to another wonderful class uh, here in the Michaels Community Classroom. I am Meredith from Beadalon, and I am very much looking forward to hanging out with you guys today for our class. So I believe class today is um, called something like uh, beadboard is, a, is an important tool for you to do your designing while you are designing jewelry. Something, something to that effect. Um, and I agree with that statement that I just made up wholeheartedly. We are not only going to be talking about designing with a beadboard today, but as I believe this is at least the third, if not the fourth, in our beadboard designing series, we are going to next level it. All of the previous beadboard design classes have focused on a single strand design, and today we are going to talk all about using the beadboard to design multi-strand designs. So I am going to talk about, I'm going to go first go over the basics of the beadboard just in case you need a little refresher or if you've missed part one, two, and possibly three of our beadboard series. Um, and then we're going to jump in and talk design. So <clears throat> my, my caveat, my, my disclaimer is I believe that design is a really personal um, really is a very personal thing. And my design aesthetic might not be your design aesthetic. Your design aesthetic might not be your neighbor's design aesthetic. So I'm going to talk about um, kind of the choices that I make um, and extrapolate onto some choices that you might want to make. But I'm a really firm believer that there, there really aren't that many rules to designing jewelry. The rules really come in when you are talking about form and um, the function of your materials. And I'm going to talk about that um, a little bit um, as we go along today as well. So talking about the beadboard, talking about multi-strand design, talking about design in general. And the fourth thing that I'm going to touch on is taking a design that I have actually, that I've already made and recreating it completely differently. So as designers, as beaters, as creative people, um, or as um, new people to this whole experience, uh, we spend a lot of time looking at things that other people make, right? Like we go on Pinterest boards, we go on the Beatalon website, we go on the Michaels site, we look at all of these different people on Instagram and TikTok and all the different places. And when you are, when you're designing, it's, it's a great place to start to recreate somebody's design exactly. But once you start down the path in your journey of designing, you really don't want to take somebody else's design specifically. And you certainly don't want to pass that person's design off as your own. So we're also going to, as part of our whole class today, we're going to talk about this one design that I made and how to completely change it to make it, well, also my own, but <laughs> it could be somebody else's my own also. So let's see, I think that that is, um, those are the things that I'm going to touch on. And of course, as always, please feel free to write any, um, if you're joining us live for class, write your questions over in the comments and I will see them as they scroll by, as they scroll by. But we also have Yvette from Beadalon here in the chat who will um, answer any questions that she can, as well as if I don't see anything, she'll, she'll come on in and give me a little tap, a little nudge and let me know that I have missed something. So um, without any more discussion, I think we're ready to go ahead and take the overhead camera so you can see this is our overview. This is like the summary of everything that we're going to be doing today, right? That's a lot to, a lot to manage in all in one place. So let me go ahead and now that I've given you a little preview, a little tease, of everything that we are going to be talking about today. I'm gonna to move our second beadboard out of the equation. I'm going to move this one necklace out as well and talk about the inspiration for class today. So I'm gonna move this down a little bit and I'm going to realize that I have left, I was sorting out beads beforehand. <laughs> I realized that I left some of these gold beads over here on my beadboard. So I am just going to very quietly move these to the side. So for a beadboard, first and foremost, 
So that's what we're talking about. And it is a very important tool for not only designing, but in my opinion, invaluable for when you're designing multi-strand necklaces. Now this was the original, um, the original piece for this class, but it's the end of September. It's a little beachy. We like in the end of September to start thinking more fall, less summer. Um, but I, we're going to use this as the basis of recreating this design using totally a different color palette, different styles of beads, but still keeping the inspiration for this design. But I have this laid out, it is a finished design, because I wanted to use this as an opportunity to talk about what the beadboard is. So here is our beadboard very simple. It's a flocked material. It's nice and soft to the touch. It makes it very easy to grab your beads out and it prevents things from rolling around. So just the, the flocking of the material is really um, a great, a great thing to do. It can get dirty though, just full disclosure. So just be careful, um, especially if you're using, um, maybe if you're cutting things apart that you know might be a little dirty on the inside. But I have a bead board that I've had for probably 15 years and it's filthy, but it still works. <laughs> it does not, I'm, I'm not bothered by that. So bead board has, let me just pull this up so everyone can really see, three channels. So inside channel, middle channel, outside channel. And along the outside of the outside channel, there are inch marks. So we start at zero and we go all the way up and around to technically around to 17, okay? On both sides. On the inside channel, we've got centimeter marks. And near as I can tell from the, the consensus in the beading community, most people use that that outside channel with the um, with the inch marks to do their designing. Um, it's just kind of industry convention. But if you're more comfortable using the inside, that's okay too. If you're if you're more of a, a comfortable with centimeters kind of a person. But the the real value I think in not only the measuring part for our um, for our beadboard today is being able to lay out a design for a multi strand necklace. A couple more things on about the beadboard before we start laying out our design. There are also lots of little compartments, and I like to. I'd like to think that I keep all of my little beads and everything this neat and this compartmentalized in my beadboard, but that's the, that's the instructor <laughs> in me. Real life, Meredith, this would be filled with just a ton of beads. And I think in the third of our beadboard um, videos that you can go back and watch on the Michael's YouTube channel after class today, um, you can see the disaster that my beadboard generally is. I'm trying, I'm trying to be a little bit better, but we like to keep it real here, right? We don't wanna, we don't put on any false, any false, uh, false pretenses that I am a neat beater. Um, okay, so a couple other things. We have our little compartments that we can keep different things in. I have my little clasp down here because um, I don't know about you all, but I spend so much time looking for stuff in my studio even if I have thought that I have put it someplace so that I don't have to rip my entire studio apart looking for it. So when I can't find my class later, perhaps somebody can help me um, by reminding me that it is right down here, set aside. So something else that I like to point out as well about the beadboard is if you turn it around like this, this is the perfect place to design a bracelet. So it, I don't know when this occurred to me, but <laughs> probably not immediately. But you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and about a half of an inch on either side here. Perfect size to lay out a bracelet design. Oftentimes when I'm doing a bracelet, I'll either just string it up or um, use a bead mat. But this is perfect because my beads aren't going to roll around and then I can spend a lot of time moving them around. Um, maybe I want it to start in the bit in the middle and move to the side. Maybe I want my designs to repeat and I want to make sure that I have enough, um, I have the right number of beads to do that, that re repetitive design. 
um, you can lay your beads out here before you put them on memory wire, right? You don't just have to do straight up bead stringing when you are using, um, when you are using a bead board to design. So, and I like to flip it around when I do it like that. If you wanna move and work up here at the top, totally your choice. So here is one design that I have laid out on the bead board. And you can see that A, it's longer than the, um, than the spaces here. And B, it's a little, it's a little wonky. And that, that is on purpose because one of the challenges to designing a multi-strand necklace is making sure that all of your strands are properly proportioned. And when we start doing our designing, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, honestly, the best thing that you can do is pick it up and try it on. And the best thing to use when you pick it up and try it on are bead bumpers, or I'm sorry, not bead bumpers, um, bead stoppers. Oh, we're going to have that brain today, Meredith, clearly bead stoppers. And they come in a, in a couple of different brands and these are available at Michaels and at michaels.com. Um, but bead stoppers, and we're going to use these when we start our designing as well, are a great material for making sure that your beads do not fall off of your necklace as you are trying it on. Another idea is to use a bust or a friend, right? Um, now here I have a necklace that's five strands long. So clearly I only had three here and I'm using five. So again, we just things around, we, we, you know, do three and then two. There are all kinds of kind of creative ways of making sure that our necklaces fall the way that we want them to. But I move the pearls over because I want to make the point that see how close these strands are to each other. That is the look that I wanted for this necklace. Um, for, if I wanted it to be a little bit further apart, like in this necklace here, everything isn't, I'm trying to hold it so it is all the right way, which is going to be impossible, but there's a lot more space in between here. So again, our bead board is a good, guide. It's not going to be um, like do this and it will be perfect. There's a lot of zhuzhing that happens back and forth, a lot of taking it off, putting it back on, taking beads off. So I don't want people to get frustrated if you use a bead board and you lay everything out and you put your, um, your spacer bars on and you attach it the way you want. And then all of a sudden you put it on your body and it doesn't look right. A lot of different factors come into play, not the least of which is the size of your beads. So again, in all of these things that we're doing in designing, sure, we have our beads, we love our beads, these beads are so pretty, but we also have to think about construction and making our materials work for us the way that we want them to. And really listen, sounds silly, but listening to the beads and listening to the beat where the beads want to go and, and allowing them to guide the design process to a certain extent. Um, and I'm just thinking if there is anything else that I wanna say about that. I actually wrote down some notes for class today to make sure that I touched on all of the things. So we walked through each place in the bead board. We talked about the inches and the centimeters. Um, Sure, we talked about that. We talked about the bracelet. Talked about large beads making a difference. Okay, so let's now talk. Let's actually get down to the nitty gritty. Let's start laying out our design. So I am going to, I'm going to work on this bead board and kind of move things in because I think things are a little bit too jumbled <laughs> over here. Um, so using this as our guide, what I wanted to do was have that space, the faux sea glass in um, a repeating pattern around. I wanted to use bugle beads as part of the spacer. 
to almost look like the that like they are strung on glass. I don't know if people can kind of understand um, or to, to see that, um, but I wanted the effect of it looking like it's not strung necessarily on cording or on beading wire, but being strung on glass. So we're going to replicate replicate that as well. And then I just have some kind of spacer beads and other little things dabbled in here. These spacer bars at the end um, are one of my favorite design elements. They're actually technically reducer bars because they reduce your strands from five, or in my case, three, to one. Okay, and um, I, I actually have a little bit of a bonus technique to show at the end. Um, if you don't have a reducer bar like this, if you only have a, um, a like a, a spacer bead like this one. Okay, so we're going to talk about that at the end, hopefully. Uh, now that I've mentioned it, I got I have to show it. Um, I did that same technique over here with five to one. I think it is a lot easier to finish off your multi-strand necklace like this than it is to gather all of your strands together. I think this looks more professional um, and that's to my eye, but if you like doing it a different way and there are a ton of different ways to do it, um, that, that actually would be a great class in and of itself. Um, and somebody in the chat, I just wanted to mention, um, mentioned this clasp here, it's a magnet and it is available at Michael's. Um, this project, actually this necklace is um, a project on the Michael's website. If you're looking for it, it is under the projects tab. I think you just have to scroll through um, to find it, but it's, it's there with all the instructions and the materials list as well. So it's an old project that I made, but it's still, it's still relevant today. And then here, what I have done is I have actually added a hook to a piece of chain to make this nice and adjustable. It also looks pretty, right? To have a little dangle do there on the end. And I could have put a little wrapped loop on this as well. I just chose not to. Okay, so for designing, I have a blank slate, right? I'm making a multi-strand necklace. Could I use the beadboard for just one strand? Certainly, why not? Um, I can uh, just use this outer channel to do one strand of a necklace. And as I mentioned, we have a couple, at least a couple, if not three or four, um, previous classes that you can find on the Michaels YouTube channel um, that Beadalon has done. Um, Sarah Lovecraft, one of our other amazing designer instructors, um, has done at least two. And I'm pretty sure that I have done one as well. So, um, but today we're going to talk about doing a multi-strand because there are several extra, um, extra things that you have to be aware of when you are designing a multi-strand necklace. And what I like to do is I start with my, I call them the stations, um, and I like an odd number. So I have one here in the middle and that's where, where that zero comes in really handy. Let's come nice down and close to that zero. Um, that is, that's my middle. So maybe I want to have a focal pendant that is hanging down. Maybe I want to have a wire wrapped element. These are all teases for upcoming classes that's hanging down. Um, maybe I want to have a charm hanging down. Maybe I don't want anything hanging down, which is what I'm doing in this, in this case, but this is going to be the center of my necklace. This will be the center of my second strand, and this will be the set, set center of my third strand. Okay, let's get our words together, Meredith. So oftentimes when I am designing, I have a specific number of, of a specific kind of bead. So in this case, I have five of these round coin beads. I actually have six, but I want to keep, um, keep my, my center point, um, my center, and then work out from there. So now I can use um, math. Hmm. Never <laughs> told me math would not be involved. But interestingly, 
it's funny, my, my son is in sixth grade. And one of the questions that they get asked a lot is, do you think that you will use this information, whatever the information is later in life? And the kids, and of course, when we were kids too, we always said, no, we're never going to need to know this later on in life. But actually I use math um, a lot when I'm doing my designing. And sometimes I wish I had paid a little bit better attention, just saying. Okay. So because I have this extra one here, I'm going to see if how that looks on my third, my third strand. Now, one of the things that I was mentioning earlier when I was talking about this piece is how, um, how close and far away from each other these three strands are. If you design just up to the eight on both sides so that everything is, is perfectly even on, in these three channels, those three strands are going to be very close together as you, as they are hanging, which is something, see how I'm moving my, my pinkies, how you can account for that by going up another inch to, or a half of an inch to an inch on the outside to make that, that, um, that longest strand just a little bit longer. So again, it's all about the zhuzhang. Um, and, and playing around with different design ideas and playing around with different beads. Again, because this, um, this bead is longer, it's going to fall down a little bit lower and also hit a little bit higher. So you don't think, or I, I hadn't thought as I'm doing all of this designing that all of these things need to come into account when we are making our strong necklace. But in fact, we have to think about all of these things as we're making our strong necklace. So let's do some more designing. So using this as my inspiration, what I have done is kind of everything is in odds, right? So I have, um, I have this section here that has the faux glass bead, two rondelles, and a bead cap. Well, I don't have any bead caps in gold, but um, because I decided that my, um, my design palette <laughs> was going to be blue, brown, and gold today, I have these really pretty gold spacers that are going to serve the same purpose. Now, and I'm glad that I have everything in these sizes and we're using rondelles because one of the, one of the traps that you could fall into is thinking that this is the amount of space or this is the amount of space that these beads are going to take up. But of course they're not um, because they are flat and long. It's actually this amount of space. So that will come into play when we're, when we're filling everything in a little bit more and when that pesky math comes back into play again. Um, but I'm gonna start filling this in a little bit more with some um, of the, the beads that I'm using. Um, these rondelles that I'm using, the gold and the blue, all came from those, um, those there are four strands of beads. And I apologize, I have now cut apart so many of my beads and put them into different storage containers that I don't have a, a full example to show anymore. Um, but I do wanna mention there's a really good comment in the comment section for um, my, my students who are watching live. And the comment is, do you use bead caps when you're using larger beads so smaller beads don't slide into your big bead holes? That's a really good point. And I want to thank Tara for asking that question. That is another design, design consideration that is again kind of in that category of above and beyond just thinking about how our beads are going to look together it's again how our beads are and how our jewelry is constructed so the short answer to the question is yes um, but not necessarily only bead caps if I have a bead that has a large hole I'm just looking over here to see if I can grab one here's a great example here is a bead that has a very large hole right? So I can do a number of different things um, when I am using this bead. 
Not the least of which is putting a nice bead cap on the, over the side. Again, I'm just looking for a bead cap here. You could also use a rondelle like this. So that's going to give it that smaller hole there. Say I wanted to put a seed bead next. I couldn't put a seed bead here or a um, bugle bead for that matter, but I could if I used a, a rondelle, a smaller bead here, a bead spacer, that's the word I'm looking for. I could also use a bead cap here, but this bead cap has a little bit of a, a lar larger hole. So even though it's a bead cap, it might need another bead with a smaller hole. And that is always a consideration for me when I'm finishing off a design. I never like to finish off a design with a large bead and especially not a large bead with a large hole. Very good question. Um, okay, so let's see. Now I have these gold beads here. So I'm thinking that I might want, and this is part of why designing with a bead board is so great, is because you can test out a whole bunch of different ideas. So instead of taking the time to string everything up, you could, you can just use the bead board to brainstorm all of your different ideas. I'm not a big sketcher when it comes to, um, when it comes to laying out my designs, I tend to sketch with the beads rather than with a pencil and paper, um, which is a nice way of, um, I know a lot of designers do that when they are designing. I'm not a big pencil and paper kind of a sketcher. I really like to lay my beads out and see how they are enjoying each other's company. So I am just gonna come in here with these smallest, blues. And when I'm designing a, um, a multi-strand bracelet or a multi-strand um, necklace, I also like to go larger beads to smaller beads. I don't always do that, um, but to my eye and to my design aesthetic, I like the way that that looks the best. So I'll start with larger beads on the outside and move to the inside with smaller beads, much like I did over here with the pearls. But here on this necklace, it's kind of providing our inspiration today. I, I did and I didn't do that. I put my, my starfish in the middle. So I kind of played around with the different sizes, but generally, um, generally speaking, I like to go from bigger to smaller. Now, it, and this is also why a bead board is a really good design tool because I only have four of these littlest blue beads. So I wanna make sure as I'm designing, if I wanna make a symmetrical design, which generally I do, um, I am putting them in a way that they are going to be either built out or built together symmetrically. All right, so now I have this next size up. So I'm going to put these in. And again, I, I did not, I kind of didn't really pre, um, or pre prep this design because I really wanted to be able to talk through um, all of the different things that I might consider as I'm putting together a multi strand design. And I would love to know, I'm, I'm noticing over here in, um, in the comments, if, if, the, if this is similar to how you design. Do you, um, oh, that's a little husky extra bead in there. Um, do you kind of lay, lay your beads out and let them tell you where they wanna go? Do you, do, you, um, do you design like me or do you design differently? It's very, very interesting to me. So let's see. Two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, nine. So we need to pull that guy out. And you can see what I was talking, what I was talking about earlier with this bead here. And again, I have my camera back a little ways just because I'm doing a lot down here with my fingers. But this bead here, if I don't account for this extra space, these two beads are probably going to end up touching with this in the middle. So I will have to 
judge, think about, be attentive of, be cognizant, that that is going to be something from a structural perspective that needs to be addressed. Um, so let's go and put these here. And because, as I mentioned, I want to end with smaller beads. So I'm just going to put these smaller beads on the end um, so that I remember that that's where I want to end. And see how I'm doing this up at the eight? Because that is where, if I want a 16 inch necklace, <coughs> which is generally where I start. So a 16 inch necklace is a, is a kind of a standard length of a necklace. It's gonna hit me right above, um, or kind of right in my, my throat. Is that your clavicle? Um, that, that is kind of the perfect place for a necklace to hit for me. For you, that necklace might be at the seven mark or that necklace might be at the 12 mark. One of the best tips that I have been reminded of recently is have a necklace that is kind of your, your sample necklace. So it's a necklace that you know is the perfect size for you or the perfect size for one of your customers or the perfect size for your mom who you make gifts for a lot. Whatever it is, that necklace is your perfect size. And then what you can do is lay that necklace down on your beadboard and start making your adjustments and your tweaks and your zhuzhs. That's, what is that? Are we on zhuzh count? Is that the fourth time I've been able to say that this class? So that's a really good way of also keeping in the back of your head how, how you are sizing things, how you're making things proportionate. So for me, that, that always starts at the eight. And then if I wanna go a little bit longer, I'll go a little bit longer. If I wanna go a little bit shorter, if I'm making a choker or a, or a Zoom necklace, as I like to call them, I might, I might go a little bit shorter. No, not generally too, too short for me. I like, I like a necklace to, to sit right at that kind of um, that little indentation right at the, the nape of my neck, the nape of my neck, no, that's the back of your neck. You guys know what I mean. All right, so now I have those same rondelles. Can you tell I've, I've got a, a thing going on here in gold? So I just poured them out and I'm gonna do that same thing and kind of figure out, all right, well here in, in with my pattern, I'm, I'm losing some space, right? but I have a lot that I need to make up on the, on the outside. So I'm going to take my smallest ones again and just kind of lay them out. And here I can go along those centimeter marks and point out how you might use those centimeter marks. So maybe I want one at every centimeter. Although now I'm remembering I wanna add in those bugle beads. So I'm gonna go every other centimeter. And now I'm here on my blues. Maybe I want one in, in the middle. I don't know, I'm just kind of playing around with placement, playing around with how things look to my eye. And maybe it's starting to get too busy. Maybe this color of gold here on the outside isn't quite the right color of gold that, that works with the rest of this design. I don't know if, if that is translating well um, to the, in the camera, but this gold is a little bit of a different color than this gold and this gold. So I'm thinking I might pull it out, okay? And yes, um, eight on each side makes a 16 inch necklace. If you wanna go up to nine inches on either side, that would be of course an 18 inch necklace. You always have to account for your clasp. So do you have a long clasp? Do you have a short clasp? Do you have a little magnetic clasp? Are you doing an extension clasp? Again, so many choices that need to be made in jewelry making. That's what I, that's why I think it's, it's the most fun because you get to, to consider all of these things, to make all of these choices, to think about how the sizing of your beads, the sizing of, of the rest of everything um, comes into play. And as you know, because I work for Beadalon and we make and manufacture the beading wire, oftentimes, um, our classes for beetle on can be very heavily focused on the wire. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's fun for me to be able to play around a little bit more with design than I necessarily um, 
I necessarily always do. Okay, so I have my three beads here, my three beads here. One, oh, here's what I did. I came in here and did the focus this focus. And then what is going to end up happening is I'm going to come back in with those bugles and take in all of the excess space. But before I do that, I don't, I don't like the, um, this gold, um, the difference in gold. So I'm going to pull those out and I'm going to replace it with the brighter gold of these rondelles. And it's interesting to me how the variations in different gold beads can be. So we might have, oh, let me put these down right here. We might have several different strands of gold beads, but let's see if I can really show this. Here's one shade of gold, and that shade of gold does not look right with the, um, with the other two shades. So I am going to pull that out. And my, I'm thinking, so some people are, are giving some really nice notes, some nice comments about how this gold in the middle looks a little busy. Wait till you see what I do with it and then see if you if you agree after that. So I'm going to pull these guys out because they don't they don't look right to me. So I'm going to pull these out and maybe what I do is I replace them with these golds. So let's see what that looks like. Okay. So again, not, not, I'm not committing to one design yet. I'm using my beadboard as a way to test out all of these different thoughts, all of these different theories, all of these different what ifs. And you all know, if you hang out with me in class that you know that I love a what if. So let's see. That was a good what if. I like that a lot. I am gonna pull this, these ones out too. And maybe this design needs two strands instead of three. I don't know, maybe, maybe that is something to consider as well. Maybe the design, instead of wanting to be busier, maybe it wants to be less busy. But one of the things that I do wanna do is pull in these bugle beads because what I really liked about this design that I made here is how those bugles end up looking like um, looking like glass, like it's strung on glass. Now the beadboard really is supposed to make it easier. So if designing on a beadboard is not helpful for you, do don't don't. There's no reason to use a beadboard. I just like using it to have that that natural curve it's going to be the natural curve of my neck and to have the measurements so that I know that everything is going to generally line up so I'm going to put these blue bugle beads in here this is what is this color aqua straight up aqua for my friends at John Bead of course and a really fun pop of color and I think I'm going to keep and pull this guy out and put that in. And it's neat to see the, um, the comments um, coming through, again, for those of you who are watching live, um, to, to kind of see as we're, as we're designing together, some people love, love it one way, other people are more inclined to, um, to go another way with the design. But look what happens when you start adding in these little bugle beads. It changes everything, right? And I am also able to push my beads, let's get my big hand out of there, together to have a much better sense of what my spacing is. So in the beginning, your spacing is going to be 
kind of all over the place the way I showed it. Oh, I want to keep that there. And then as you continue to add your beads, things are going to come into place. And for example, I'm now noticing that this bead here is a little bigger than I would like it to be on the end. So I'm going to pull these out. And since I don't have, do I not have any more of those little, I take that back. I have two right here. So I'm going to use the littler ones here at the end. Because again, as I was saying, I want smaller, smaller beads on the end. So let's see, what do I have over here? And then oftentimes I will notice that things have gotten a little jumbled up. Maybe my counting wasn't quite right. Again, if, if using a bead board makes your job as a designer easier, then by all means use it. If it makes your design as a, as a beater more difficult, I wouldn't recommend it, <laughs> right? Um, but one of the great things about these classes that we're able to teach for the Michaels Community Classroom is being able to show alternatives, being able to show different ways. Because there are so many different, um, different techniques. There are so many different tools. There are so many different options, so many different ways of doing things that what clicks for one beater might not click for another beater. So variations, designs, what works for you um, might not work for someone else and vice versa. All right, that's not bad. I'm kind of checking my work against the camera here. Um, and I wanna do that same thing on the outside. And the really, the coolest thing that's gonna end up happening with these bugle beads is once I get my wire through them and I'm actually using 19 strand satin gold for when I get to stringing. Um, and don't worry, I will not make you sit here and watch me string this whole project up. We're gonna, we're gonna cooking show it or fast forward it to the end. Um, but what was I gonna say? Um, once, since, because these beads are silver lined, the wire going through them is going to change their color just a little bit um, and look really, really cool. So totally different than my original design that I'm being inspired by to make it my own over here. Um, but still a lot of the same concept. And that's part of what I love um, about uh, switching up materials after being inspired by somebody's design is I have still kept a lot of the same ideas, but it doesn't look anything the same, even though I'm still using the blues and because I'm using gold instead of silver, because I'm using those coin beads instead of the starfish, because I'm using one bugle bead instead of three bugle beads. It's just so many different, so many different ways of doing things. So I think I do want to put that third that third row in just just for fun but the way that we're going to do that is I'm going to use the bugle beads and then some very small gold beads Eek. and if one bead gets in there we're just going to hide that <laughs> we're just going to hide it for now and this is not this isn't a process that should cause anything but fun if you're not having fun using a bead board to design with, don't use a bead board to design with. So let's see, I have two different gold beads here. I have a kind of a squarish one and then a hexagonal looking one. I think I wanna go with these hex ones. They look kind of fun. And we're just gonna go big beads, little bead. <laughs> Easiest design ever, right? Big bead, little bead. And in fact, I like the way that that looks so much. I might just do that <laughs> as a necklace with these bugle beads. And I, I, I love highlighting bugle beads in designs. I feel like they are an unsung hero of the beading world. Um, they, they just 
they make me happy. I really like bugle beads. And there are several different colors of bugle beads in Michael's and we have some fun projects coming up um, using bugle beads. So definitely keep an eye out on the Michael's Community Classroom signup site because um, through the holidays, especially, we just submitted our November and December classes to, um, to be posted. And I think that all of my BD friends are really going to enjoy what not only I, but also um, what Sarah Lovecraft has in store for everybody over the holidays. We've got some really creative designs. Um, so just keeping on going. And I never, I never, tr it's not really, I never trust, but I never go just by what my measurements are here. I'm always playing around and checking and um, I'm trying not to say judging again, but I really want to. <laughs> and I also love when the strand of beads has the perfect number on it. Um, so I don't have any left over, although I do always like having a couple left over for earrings. Um, but I do like when it works out perfectly. And again, I'm just, I'm working right up to that eight mark here and that eight mark here, just to give me a place to start. Um, I will have to, like I mentioned, add and subtract to make sure that everything is in place or in the right way. Oops, I don't need that one. Um, okay, so finishing up on the design, on the design portion. So now I have my design generally how I want it. I'll probably tweak it a little bit. I'll also have to double check and go back and just make sure that I haven't added extra beads anywhere. I haven't forgotten a bead. Um, that's another reason why the bead board is a great tool is because you can really see and make sure that um, maybe this one doesn't quite look right. So I'm going to replace it with a smaller one here. You can kind of move everything around and just make sure that you haven't made any errors before you start stringing. I hate when I start stringing something and maybe I've strung it from this end and I'm going all the way around to the next end. And then I realize right in the middle, I have either um, skipped a bead or put a wrong bead size in or a bead, but wrong bead color. Again, just a really great way to to use it to do your designing. Okay, so really, really quickly, and I did mention that I will not be, um, I will not be stringing everything up um, while, while you all are watching, but I'm going to use a 0.018 satin gold 19 strand um, bead, I'm sorry, a bead wire <laughs> to string this up. And of course I need my corresponding crimp tube. So I'm just going into my little crimp tube container to look for my number twos and they are actually not in a the container. They're right down in there. So I will use those. But the way that I like to attach my, um, my multi-strand necklaces is by, um, is using a multi-strand connector or a, um, they call them connector bars. I call them reducer bars because we're reducing from five to one. Okay, and let's see if we can get a little part number there for anybody who's curious. And these are, um, you get four, two in silver and two in gold. So you can make two necklaces. So of course, since we're working in gold today, I'm gonna pull the gold out. And you'll notice that this is a five to one connector bar, but I'm only using three of those strands, right? I'm only using three strands onto five, which I actually really like doing because it gives it naturally that extra amount of space to do your, to um, have your design lay correctly. If those two extra loops bother you, does do those two let extra loops bother anybody else? You can either cut them off, right? You can use a um, just a, a nipper, a cutter to very carefully cut those off. A memory wire shear would actually probably be a great tool for that job. And then you would want to come in with a nail file and just file those holes down. 
or you could add something to them, right? You could add a little dangle to them, a little surprise, or you could just leave them as they are. It doesn't bother me, but if it bothers you, easy enough to, to cut those off. Um, something else that I wanted to show here when we were talking about the reducing everything to a smaller amount, I'm actually using a size eight seed bead in between those bugle beans and, um, and my crimp, just because the bugle beads tend to, especially because they are glass, they tend to be a little fragile sometimes and a little prone to cracking. So I wanted to put just a little bit of an extra um, insurance of movement in between on the end of my necklace. Now, could I have come back in here and used some crimp covers over my crimp tubes? Sure, why not? Design choice, um, I chose not to, um, but I certainly even now could go back and do that at the end. Um, so let me just show really quickly without going into too much of um, detail, but to show very quickly, let me pull out a long enough piece. What I would then do and again, nobody needs to see me stringing up this entire design onto my necklace. But of course I have my correspondingly sized crimp tube and my beading wire. And I like to start in the middle and go out. So I would, I would actually um, string up my middle strand first and then my longest and then my shortest. Um, is that a tried and true beading rule? I'm not sure. It's just how I find that it is best for me to be able to tell those sizes, I'm sorry, yeah, the sizing of my strands. So real quick, because you can never have too many opportunities to learn about crimping, right? We have our crimp tool. I'm going to come in here, make sure that my wire is not, um, not crossed in my crimp. I've got a little bit of wiggle room there. It's a little hard to see, but I definitely have some wiggle, arm, wiggle room there. Coming in that front part of my crimp tube, I'm going to gently press it down. No death grips here. I'm gonna move it to the back with my crimping pliers and make sure that I get the whole crimp in my crimping pliers. Sometimes that means that I have to kind of move it back and forth a little bit. Then I'm gonna come back in the front and make sure that everybody can see what I'm doing. And I am going to, let's try that one last time. There we go. Oops, oh, does it keep, keep slipping on me? I'm gonna come back into the front of my pliers. There we go. And round it around. And for all of those uh, beauty friends who play along, what am I going to say next? Anyone, anyone, what am I going to say next? I'm going to say, do not come and smush this into the front of the beading flyers. You're done. Give a little, little tug and it's done. If you have matched your wire, your crimps, your crimp tube, and you've done that nice one, two, three crimping process, you don't wanna come in here and flatten because all that does is crack the crimp and break the wire, okay? So then I would do that, I would um, string that up, string all my beads up and then come out over to the other end and then do that on the middle of the second. Now, pro tip, important thing to remember. You wanna make sure that when you are adding your spacer bars, if they are not the same on both ends. See how one end is decorative and one end is non-decorative? You wanna make sure that they are facing the same way when you do your crimping. And then you also wanna make sure that when you are adding your top strand, your shortest strand, you want to attach top to top. And then when you are attaching your bottom strand, your longest strand, you wanna go bottom to bottom. Okay. And I realized that you could do it this way too, but you just want to make sure that one strand goes to the same, the same side 
Otherwise, you are going to have one bar with a decorative side up and one bar with the non-decorative side up. It will also help you when you are putting your necklace on to make sure that it doesn't get tangled or crossed in any way. And on one of these, I don't know if it is this one or on, um, yep, it is on this one. Perfect. Okay, I'm glad. So on the original necklace, I was not paying attention and I attached it wrong. So when I wear this, when I put it on, when I hook it correctly, I'm trying to get it in here, it keeps catching on everything. One side is flat and one side is decorative. Is that the end of the world? No, because it's going to be hooked under my hair and nobody is going to see it except for me. However, if I were going to sell this piece, if I were going to gift this piece, if I were going to put this piece in the boutique, um, I would of course want it to be perfect, right? I don't want it to be, um, to be strong incorrectly. And so again, just those little things to keep in mind as you are, um, as you are designing. Um, eventually I will cut one side off and fix it, but it's really important to be able to show mistakes as well and show why there are mistakes and the severity of them, right? So is this the worst mistake I've ever made? No, <laughs> certainly not, um, but it's something just to be aware of. So really, really quickly before, um, before we sign off today, I just wanted to mention, I, I had mentioned and I just wanted to, um, to show really quickly a way that you can use um, the, the Michael's calls these sliders to also do this kind of a connection. So this is a spacer bar that I have attached a piece of chain on one side and a clasp on the other. But what you can do if you don't have um, a spacer bar like that, but you have a spacer bar like this that has three, three, there we go, three holes in it. That's a little bit of an easier way to say. How can I show? There we go, three holes. See, I promise that they're three holes. So really, really quickly, this is kind of a bonus. I like giving a little, little bonus at the end of class. What you can do is come in with either beading wire or a really easy way to do it is using head pens. So what you can do is you take three head pins. So I have one head pin and and apologies, I'm gonna go about five minutes over class today. So if you do have to run, I have, I've covered all of the stuff about the designing with the beadboard and multi-strand necklace. This is just a fun little extra. Okay, so I have these and then I'm gonna take um, a little seed bead. I think that this will be big enough. And I'm going to string onto my head pin one seed bead. Okay, and the reason why I'm using that seed bead is so we were talking earlier so that it doesn't slip through that hole. Okay, so I have that here. And what I can do on this side is actually add another seed bead just to make my life easier. You could even do a decorative bead here if you wanted to. And then I'm going to come with my pliers and I'm going to make a wrapped loop. Okay, so over wrap loop around really quick. This is the bonus for people who get who stay until the very end. It's probably a larger wrap loop than I necessarily wanted to and a little bit messier, but you're going to get the, the general idea of what I'm doing. So let me snip that off here. And then I'm going to do that same thing on the outer one. So I've done it on the this outer one, and then I'm going to do it the same same way, the same direction here. Okay, so seed bead here, and then seed bead on the end. And you could use size eights. You don't have to use size elevens if you don't want to. They just happen to be what I had right up here on my um, on my beading area. 
So let's see if I can do this, this round loop just a little bit better, okay? Just a little bit better. Let's see if the trained professional can do a more professional looking wrap loop. I'm not really a trained professional. I'm a self-taught kind of pretends to be a professional. That's a better one. All right. And so now what I have is two loops, one incredibly messy gross loop, and then one nice pretty loop right here, okay? But now what I need to do is I need to make a loop on both sides in the middle. And this works for all kinds of spacer bars, um, whether they are, um, really doesn't matter what they look like as long as they have three, um, three holes through them. And conveniently, I have grabbed an eye pin, so we're just gonna go with that. Um, instead of making the loop on one side, we're just gonna go with the eye pin and pick up another size 11, except for my eye pin is not working with these size 11. So back to my original idea. And you could use a, um, a piece of wire for this last one as well, because what you actually need to do is snip off the end here, because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a loop on both ends, okay? So actually, I'm gonna go back to this one. I just need to find a bead that it's gonna fit through to prove my point, right? I need to prove my point. Here we go, okay. So now I have two loops on one side, one loop on the other side, switch this around. Sorry, friends. So all my three of my loops are on one side now. And so I would attach one, two, three um, of my strands here on this one side. And now I have reduced it down to one on this side. So I can come through here. And again, those little beads, it's just a hair thicker. They're not fitting through. So what do I do? I figure out a different way to do my design, right? I add a different kind of a bead. So I come in here and add a wrapped loop on the top here. So again, three loops on one side. If you have a five, a five, um, five space connector, you can do the same, very same technique. You would just do it with two on either side and one in the middle. And I feel like I just need to prove that I can do a really nice wrap loop. <laughs> so I'm taking my time on this one <laughs> because look at what happened with my first one. Oh, I feel like I need to redo that for all of you as well. But you know, you guys know I can do a wrap loop. That's what happens when you're not paying close attention, right friends? So this ends up being the same idea but now we have a sparkly one, which I know not everybody is a sparkly girl, but the more things that I can make sparkly, the better. So this could be a great way to make a three strand necklace or, or bracelet, right? You can make this with a three strand bracelet just as easily and just as well as using this technique for a necklace. So whew, that was a, a quick and down and dirty extra little bonus there for a um, for a beaded design. I will finish this design and go ahead and post that over on um, my Instagram page, Meredith Joy Designs, and I will hashtag make it with Michaels and also hashtag beetle on as I'm hoping that everybody else who is designing using the ideas that you get from our classes will do as well. <coughs> so follow my example and oh my gosh excuse me if you have made anything from any of the tips or tricks that you have learned either today or in any of our classes for beetle on an artistic wire please go ahead post them on your socials use hashtag make it with michaels hashtag michaels classroom or michaels community classroom um, and then of course hashtag beetle on please come on over and hang out with me on my instagram at meredith joy designs we have a lot of amazing classes on behalf of beetle on for the michaels community classroom 
one coming up over the next couple of months and beyond um, on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time and many Saturdays, Sarah Love Cla Lovecraft joins us as well at 1 p.m. She's um, actually changing her time a little bit earlier to 1 p.m. Eastern time on Saturdays. So make sure that you follow and tag and join and participate. And let us know what you are up to. Thank you everybody very, very much for hanging out with me today. And until next time, happy beating. <laughs>